So today's uh, uh, topic is metrics that drive growth. Uh, before I just do that, for many of you, uh, just by way of introduction, I'm the managing director here at Techstars. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur for the last 35 years. I've been involved in seven different industries, from manufacturing of clothing, safety helpers, fashion retail, uh, for my own venture capital company back in 99 before the last dot-com crash, um, been into property development, uh, events production, uh, and operated in over six countries in Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, uh, Dubai, the UK, and also Washington, D.C. Um, prior to joining uh, Techstars a few years back, I was the chief executive officer at the Entrepreneurs' Organization based in Washington. It's the world's largest network for entrepreneurs, uh, primarily their scale-ups, which many of the startups aspire to join at some point. So I, I guess entrepreneurship has been very much part of my uh, passion uh, in helping entrepreneurs to grow in so many capacities. Uh, but also being an entrepreneur myself, I truly understand the pain points in starting a business, growing it, and then looking for funding, and then trying to find a profitable exit. So today, I think uh, what I'll be talking about is really some uh, very specific uh, conversation around metrics. And I think this is something that if many founders can get their hands on, it will allow them to really focus on the uh, what is the essentials rather than the noise. It's very easy for founders to get distracted by a lot of different advice, a lot of different um, material that which is out there, you know, available to, on the internet, um, and then also get distracted by customers, by investors. But I think if you get a clarity around what are the good metrics to follow, uh, that will really be helpful for your journey for success. And in doing so, I'm going to be talking about the different types of metrics. I'll also be talking about how you can come to a conclusion in terms of choosing the right metrics for your business. And then from there on, it's all for you to uh, take, take it forward. So the objective here is really to identify KPIs so that you, you, you know how and what to grow. So let's begin. Uh, metrics are important, uh, measuring growth of the company. Uh, it's also for getting the team to be on the same page, especially if you have more than five people. And it's also for raising capital when you talk to investors, uh, because that's a question they often ask uh, about your monthly recurring income, for example, your burn rate. Um, so not to be confused about in what investment metrics are and what management metrics are. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, be rest assured, you, you, you'll have a pretty good idea. So let's cover some basics around um, what really the significance of metrics. So lack of metrics really creates a lot of ambiguity and it can also impact growth uh, if you are focused on the wrong things. Um, understand that metrics needs to be tied to key milestones, uh, whether it's fundraising, whether it's customer acquisition, whether it's product launch 2.0. Um, and then it allows you to work backwards from those goals to set uh, mini milestones along the way. What I encourage companies to do is decide and focus on one main metric that really matters and then have a few more supporting metrics that will help them along the way. And these metrics can change uh, from week to week, uh, depending on your stage of business growth and the transition that you make from, uh, say, an MVP to a pilot stage to full commercial launch. Um, and then you want to create a simple dashboard for these metrics. I'll show you a few samples. And I think from a culture point of view, you need to be obsessed with metrics. You know, that's really the winning formula. But what I would emphasize is that at least one person should own the metric and then everyone should talk about it. So there is a peer-to-peer -peer participation around the metrics, but one person should take accountability for that. So finally, I would say that there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of hypotheses for businesses that you're operating on. Uh, but use the metrics to help you make those gut decisions, right? Those instincts that you have. Uh, in the absence of that, you're taking a lot of risks. So what to measure and what not to measure. Um, don't measure everything. Measure what matters. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Don't measure totals. 
focus on acceleration and growth. And we'll give you some specifics. But do measure things like revenue, customer user growth, churn rates, active usage, anything that has a sense of momentum and change. Uh, that, that will be very powerful. Launch dates, progress, as well as customer sales uh, and uh, lead generation. So let's get down to work. How about you take two minutes in your own time uh, to, to do this? Set your goals for the next six months and then establish one metric for your business today that you think is, is the most important metric. So set your goal and then set that one metric. And then you set two to five additional metrics that you are monitoring right now or you're thinking of monitoring right uh, for your business over the next six months. And then think about the metrics that you think investors will measure you by. I'm sure you had some conversations with, with investors or your friends in other startups. I'm sure you understand what the typical ask is. Make a note of that. Okay, I'll give you another 15 seconds to kind of think it through, then we'll move on. Great, in the real world, I would love to have you share, but I think it's gonna be cumbersome to do this on, on a video conferencing. So we'll just have to move on. So I want to give you the first example of um, a type of metric that we often look at called actionable versus van vanity. So let me give you a driving example. So if you look at your, at your speedometer in your car, um, basically you have uh, that metric that suggests the speed you're going at. Um, and that's an actionable metric. Why? Because you can adjust accelerator uh, to reduce or increase the, the speed that you require. So that's considered as an actionable metric that you can monitor um, to adjust to the situation or the environment. The, the one below is called a vanity matrix. So if you look at all the supercars, for example, so you might have a McLaren perhaps, or Porsche, but I'm not sure what you drive, but I, I assume you're more of a Porsche guy. Um, but let's say you, you have a nine, 918 and then you might go on and say on stage that I, you know, my Porsche has a 887 horsepower, you know, another guy might say a McLaren might have 890 horsepower. But frankly, if the cars are sitting in the garage for the most point, it really doesn't mean anything, right? So that's an example of a vanity uh, metric. And often uh, startups get confuse, you know, that vanity is the ones that which is most important. It's great to show off, but frankly speaking, the metric that you want to monitor is uh, the speedometer because that allows you to control the output. But let's give a, a real world example. So in the case of the startup, you think about um, how many downloads you might have. So you find a lot of um, pitch competitions even in Startup Istanbul, founders will go up there and say, oh, we've got 10,000 downloads for our new app. But really, if that's what you're looking at, then you, you, you might be misled. You should be focusing on things like how many crash reports we get a day, or how many uh, churns we get a day from those downloads. Because that's actionable. That gives you the insights needed to take corrective actions on your product development or your marketing campaign. Let's look at another, another example of a, a metric. Flow versus stock. 
So the picture bottom shows inventory of cars lying in the parking lot. And you might say, as a car manufacturer, I've got, um, uh, or maybe a shopping mall, I would have, say, you know, 1,000 cars sitting outside my shopping mall uh, car park. But that doesn't tell you so much as the flow of traffic in the above picture, which you might say, between 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on the key highway in Istanbul, for example, I'm getting about uh, 500 cars for every uh, 10 minutes uh, moving at a certain speed and in the north direction or in the south direction. So when you think about your own company metrics, you like to think about flow rather than stock. So an example in the, in the case of a startup would be daily active users versus total user signups. So that's a pretty straightforward argument. So once again, you find a lot of uh, companies trying to show off that we've got so many signups, but actually the usage is very low. So this is flow over stock. The next one is qualitative over quantitative uh, metrics. So if you look at the diagram below, it talks about in the context of cars again, and it talks about the acceleration speed, say from zero to 60, zero to 100, and again, that might give you a sense of how great the performance is. But at certain types of your business, you also want to get some qualitative uh, insights. So if you look at the description up note, it says easy to launch, revenue can rev up to, sorry, uh, rev can go up to 2100, um, uh, the clutch is easy to use, quick shifts in second gear, um, you know, it never fails to uh, engage, uh, long cooldowns, et cetera, et cetera. So what it's suggesting is it's, it's giving you insights on the performance of that experience, okay? So again, think about your business. What is the most important uh, metric? Is it qualitative data or quantitative data? Think about, in your case, you might be using NPS scores versus NPS feedback. I do this all the time for our startups uh, here at Techstars. Uh, we do get a score. Usually our scores are very high, like 90% to 100% in terms of the experience from um, us as an investor and their participation as a, uh, as a participant. But really what I look for is the NPS feedback because it might give us that even the score is high, it reveals the experience, the emotions, and the feelings of the customer. And that's really crucial and important. Here's another one that I think is really important when you think about uh, revenue and stuff like that. So let's apply the car or transportation uh, example. So in the bottom, you will have the, the distance you travel, uh, such as 37,000 miles in over two years. But really, that's not really much of importance um, versus a leading indicator to say, look, I might have only the three quarters of my gas tank. I might have 200 miles to go. So that's my range. So a leading indicator is something that really is giving you what's possible to come so you can take the corrective measures to adjust the cost of your trajectory. So let's apply that in a startup case. Um, you know, we brag about deals closed per week, whether it's customers or even fundraising. But really, you should be putting your attention to prospects or demos per week. So if you see the trending that the prospect or demos per week is declining, though you had a big close over the last three, four weeks, then it's, it's something that should be on high alert because chances are you'll be closing uh, pretty weak in about a month's time. So leading and lagging indicators is something that a lot of investors pay attention to, uh, particularly with MRR, your leads, your prospects, your auto pipeline. All this is, is really important. And then lastly, we talk about generic, specific or behavioral. So to illustrate again a driving or transportation, 
uh, example. Uh, a generic one could be, um, you know, just the speed, miles per hour. Being specific, you have the revolutions per, uh, per minute, which suggests how efficiently are you driving. And then you got behavioral, which could mean another dimension to that, which could mean the route that you take, uh, whether you're stuck in traffic, whether you took the, uh, the scenic route, um, or whether you went through a lot of speed bumps or traffic lights. And that data is also as important uh, with the generic specific and behavioral, right? So think of it from the startup example, a generic one was available cash. So we often ask startups, how much cash do you have in the bank? Say, oh, we got seven months to go. Okay, that's fine. But really, the more specific one we should be asking is monthly recurring revenue, because that will tell us how much is the net balance coming in and out of, uh, of the cash flow uh, pile that you might have. And then if I really want to probe more behind the scenes about the company, I will address a behavioral metric like our safe per workflow, which means can I get more optimization out of the labor costs that I have in my business? So understand that generic is often very superficial. It's on the surface. A specific is something which is the next level down. And then even deeper is more the behavioral uh, metric. So depending on your audience and depending on your teams, who's responsible for what, you want to be clear that you'd really have to look at three tiers of uh, tracking your metrics. So now I'd like to move on to something called KPI dynamics. And this might put all the small pieces together for you. So on the left side, you have generic, specific, and behavioral. And on the, uh, on the lower axis, you have leading and lagging indicators, right? So let's take an example. If you think about accounting KPIs, like, you know, um, your income and expense statement, you have your cash balances, that, as you already know, it's a lagging indicator because it's after the fact. It's purely a book entry uh, activity, right? There's nothing you can do beyond that. So it's not a leading indicator. Then you look at what uh, KPIs that they would excite uh, investors. So typically, uh, you've got things like daily active users, uh, monthly recurring revenue, number of signups per day, and monthly burn rate of your cash. So this is typical questions that I as an investor would ask. And then you have management KPIs. KPIs that actually you as a CEO or CTO really need to pay attention to because you can't get the net cash balance if you don't start the journey with those management KPIs. So that could be very specific to your business, right? So let's take a business which maybe is involved in social media and it could be, for example, the number of new posted pictures per day or the number of users posting not the first, second, third, but the seventh picture, because that shows retention, that shows stickiness of that particular um, uh, audience, or the number of impressions per day. So this is just a very specific example of a, a particular business. But in your business, think of those three to five management KPIs that could be specific and behavioral. Now, if you look across this entire diagram, you can also see the y and x-axis is how they interplay being generic and behavioral. And you can see that the ones which are generic are also generally tend to be lagging. And they're very much to do with more accounting type KPIs. So when you do get a due diligence from a, uh, from a legal doc, uh, from a legal, uh, from a, a legal due diligence from a investor, a lot, of the, a lot of the indicators are going to be accounting type KPIs. But at the point when you're doing, when an investor is really looking at whether this company has got potential for growth, they tend to look at user, um, active users, they look at signups, 
monthly burnt rates, etc. So understand that there is an interplay between a behavioral to generic and then leading to lagging. And that's the point I like to make here that you can figure this one out. So kind of wrap this, in, wrap this up a little bit is um, take a moment to write down what do you think are the value KPIs and I define value as you know your cash balance, uh, the number of customers you have, the total number of downloads you have, the um, the, the uh, number of uh, uh, product or features you have, IPs that you have, those are value that you create, but it doesn't necessarily suggest growth. On the flip side of that, you have the growth KPIs, for example, like um, uh, the, the retention rates of customers, the monthly, the month and month growth in terms of revenue, or the number of customer acquisitions, or the lead or prospect in your pipeline, and the, the rate of growth on that. So those are the growth KPIs that you, you like to think about. So take a minute just in silence to think about your own individual company value KPIs and growth KPIs. Okay, I guess um, I'm sure you come up with some, some thoughts around that. Let me move on. Finally, I wanted just to come back to my earlier comment with regards to that one metric that matters. It's very easy to come up with a menu or a shopping list of different metrics. And you will, when you think about generics, you look at actionable, you look at, um, you know, uh, what do you call um, uh, uh, leading or lagging indicators, you will have a whole menu of different metrics. What you really want to do is rank it as your top five that you think is important, and then finally arrive at one metric that matters today. That one metric that matters today is the one that CEO is going to say to him, to himself and the team, that come rain and shine, that we need to make sure that this company hits this metric on a weekly basis. Because if we don't, it's essentially going to uh, not drive the growth of the company. So often you get this very conflicting situation where all the five metrics are important and they all have to be worked on. Yes, granted, but what is that one thing and here's a hint or a tip. It is never the lagging indicators such as revenue. It's never the total sales. It is often the one critical metric that's driving decisions today that will impact in the long term. So you've got to think about that in a very strategic way. If I put all my efforts and resources today, for example, like lead generations or making calls, then I know that in 30 or 60 days, it's going to translate to contracts or, or sales. So I want to share with you a couple examples from a, a couple of companies that I work with who present to me on a weekly basis, a kind of a, uh, a weekly KPI uh, dashboard. So here's one company, and they are in the fintech space where they have got lenders and uh, borrowers using a peer-to-peer -peer, 
uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, business platform. So uh, on the product development, uh, they're looking at peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, um, what do you call, um, uh, contributions. So the peer-to-peer, -peer, I beg your pardon, peer-to-peer module for the product, where there's a UI, UX experience. So um, here they have a target of reaching 100%, say, back in March, but they have no change for the week, which is 0%. So they are struggling on the product development side. If I go down to, let's say, the visitor group, which is basically the, the number of uh, borrowers, they've seen a surge in activity because of the uh, um, outreach marketing programs. So where they were looking at 172 customers on median, they have got now 222 new users every week, and that's, and that's uh, on trend upwards. So, but the one metric that matters, which you see down there on the left bottom, OMTM, is the number of deposits they need to build um, a goal of $1 million for, for them to be able then to, to lend. And second, it will also trigger investors to come in to invest in the company. So back in March, the target was to, to get to a million dollars, but they were not being very successful. So they've got about 100,000 up to that mark, which means that metric that really matters wasn't giving them uh, the right efforts. Now, this becomes then a conversation piece where they said, what are the KPIs are saying? So they're saying, okay, new active users are up, we have no traction on product launch yet. We need to double down on the, the product development for the mobile app. And then bring out the conversation in front of the team. What was a big rock and what do you extend to what extent you did to demolish it? Okay. And as simple as that, and within five minutes, you'll notice that each of the metrics on the left has a specific owner. And then the discussion is openly with the team. Let me give you another example. Here's a company which is uh, tackling the duty-free aviation space. And uh, you can see that in spite of the current challenging um, situation, they're making huge progress with uh, the product development side. Now, how do you track product development? They break it down into mini milestones on a weekly basis so that they can actually reach the end goal, which is June 30th, to get all this out and ready to uh, to, to the customers. They have a few airlines who are their customers, notwithstanding what's happening out there with the airline industry today, but they have those prospects. And you can see how the KPI for business development being lead generation prospects and customers are trending on a week-to-week -week basis. So they have 30 leads and they already have met that desired number. They have 10 prospects they need to have, which means they do a demo, they do uh, a premi uh, quotation on the software, they already have five demos done. And then in terms of customers closing, they already have closed two out of the three target. If they track this uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, they know that they will be successful from that standpoint. And then we look across what the KPIs are saying. Again, it talks a little bit about just in bullet points, um, you know, where the, where the success has been, what are the roadblocks, and what they need to do differently. So those are a couple of examples that I just wanted to share. In closing, um, KPIs will enable you, number one, to create the culture of shared understanding, but also the degree of visibility and, and uh, transparency to then allow effective communications. Often I've been in meetings with startups, they have endless hours of conversations. But trust me that the process I just walk you through is literally a five minutes conversation and it's very actionable and the what really matters gets done because you're just talking on key data points as relevant to your business. 
Which also brings to the point that it's going to train your mind not to be distracted with the white noise that you constantly get through uh, the communication tools you, uh, you, you have access to, the customer complaints, uh, misleading information or advice by investors or advisors themselves. And it gives you that structured thinking that you need to drive your business. But also, this is a very important point that the KPIs has to serve a process of learning. So when you ask yourself what happened, what worked, what did not work, what was the bottleneck, it becomes a platform for learning. And it also validates your hypothesis along the way week by week. And that's a beautiful thing about KPIs. It's a journey, not a destination in which you'll be able to learn and adapt and iterate quite very much in an agile way. So that said, um, I would um, um, stop there. I think it's just on time as, as, uh, as intended uh, to open up for questions. I'll hand over the stage back to Mr. Burak to take it further. Fijai, thank you very much for these valuable uh, insights and also especially it will be very um, beneficial for i mean very valuable for the startups because these are the common questions that we also receive from when we uh, listen to the presentations especially the metrics that you have already mentioned in your presentation so there are questions of uh, what is the most important metric for the startups in prototype stage yeah very good question so i think uh, firstly let's uh, let's agree on one thing depending on the stage of your business, the metrics will evolve, okay? So what is important that, you know, your first two months might be different in your second year of doing business. Specific to the question, Mr. Barak, prototype is you focus on um, the MVP, you look at the, the, the production of what your, what your product is. So for example, if you're writing a software and you have two or three teams working with you, you might anticipate that to finish version 1.0 is it might take say 10 weeks. What you need to agree with the team is then say, let me break it down to 10 mini milestones of being 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And let's hypothetically say that it's one per week. So that now you have a goal of releasing the product 1.0, but you also have the weekly uh, expected output. And that is the way that you should focus on for prototyping, um, uh, uh, what do you call um, as a metric. The second point is that if your prototype is related to testing, where you need to test it with a, with a the lab, depending on your product or with a, with a pilot, then you want to basically take in a metric that gives feedback. So it could be an NPS score, it could be a test result score and pack it with the time frame. So within two weeks or the number of customers that you speak with. So you need to get maybe a threshold of 30 customers to validate that this is a good working product. So those will be the two metrics that I would encourage you to think about. And uh, what is your recommendation? How many um, metrics or KPIs should uh, founders can follow? If they follow many metrics, does this also lead a chaos in this startup? So, uh, yes, the simple answer is yes. Um, you know, it's all dilution of your bandwidth and your brain power. So it's okay to make a list of as many metrics as possible, but stack rank them, what are your top five? And you shouldn't be looking at more than five, at least at the CEO level. But if you're the chief marketing officer, uh, and there's a lot of business development activities, you might be looking at a number of uh, metrics, for example, like uh, impressions, signups, downloads, uh, page views, right? So those are all secondary metrics. And that could be five or six that you should be tracking. But at the CEO level, which is really what I'm trying to put the, the attention to, then you should not have more than three to five metrics. And then within the three to five, you should just have one that matters. 
And also another question is, which metrics do the startups need to share in the investor pitch decks? Yeah, that's a good one. So I'm trying to be generic in my answer because this will apply to everyone, but then it will be specific. So uh, one of the metrics would be, of course, your uh, MRR or ARR, which is annual recurring revenue or monthly re recurring revenue. In the case of customers pipeline, so you can say that uh, there'll be three stages, lead, lead, uh, qualified leads, prospects defined as where you already have an engagement, there is a pro forma proposal gone in, a demo has been gone, presented to them, just waiting for the answers. And then 30 contracts signed. So this combined three sets of data, which is on the business development side, uh, will give investors a impression of the trajectory of your growth. So that's on uh, not revenue, but it will lead to re revenue finally, but it tells you your propensity for acquisition of customers. The other uh, metric which is key is cash. Cash is king. The number one reason why business uh, startups fail is running out of cash. So when you think about that, uh, there are a couple of metrics that you need to monitor the cash. Of course, total cash balance is a lagging indicator, uh, and that's too basic. What you should be looking at is your burn rate, so the burn rate of your capital. But you should also be looking at your efficiency of your cash. In other words, um, if you are B2C type business, there is a concern among investors, are you spending more capital to apply customers? Means you're burning more cash, but the rate of return or the acquisition cost is way too high such that it's not sustainable. So to address the question of sustainability is can your business generate revenue to acquire customer? So for every $1, it should be a 1.1, not 1.0 return on your dollar. In other words, there should be a leveraging of at least 1.1 uh, to get a return on your investment. It becomes worse for every dollar you spend, you get 0.9 or 0.7 or 0.5 return in revenue. That is clearly a, uh, a recipe for disaster in terms of your strategy. Um, another question is uh, from Uche. I operate in food production and delivery optimized by technology. There is a very little guidance out there for non-pure tech products or tech products with vital brick and mortar layer. How would you suggest we communicate our value and scale potential to potential investors that are most interested in pure tech products? So if I answer the question right, you are, you are a non-pure tech product. I, I think they are in the food technology uh, and delivery. Uh, so they, uh, so uh, the, the metrics yeah. that we were talking are not matching them. So which uh, metrics and uh, also uh, values should they uh, share to the investors? So one of, one of the things that I've learned from the food business is that uh, uh, operating margins are uh, key as in terms of your, of your uh, metric. Related to that is your cost of delivery and your optimization in terms of um, waiting time, uh, what do you call, um, wasted time. And then in terms of food production, it's all about um, wastage as well as um, you know, returns because you can get returns on food. You can also experience uh, wastage over purchasing for the day, your predictability for demand. So, a metric that has predictive analytics to suggest that based on trending orders coming in or predictive demand, the purchasing of raw materials should have a certain ratio and match, and that is something to be uh, looked at. Um, so the key in your business is all about operational efficiency, um, and if you use technology to optimize it, that's beautiful. And also follow-up questions for the hardware which metrics should be uh, 
matching for their KPIs because it's also difficult to share the, especially in the pre-product stage or product stage and no sales. And uh, yeah, so so in, 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 I've dealt with a lot of hardware. I mean, my my first 20 years in my my business experience all to do with physical products, right? As opposed to services or technology. And uh, it's quite simple. Um, even if you have not launched a product, you know, you have different product development stages, right? You've got prototyping, you've got patterns to be filed, you've got testing, you've got uh, sampling. Then if your product needs to be validated by a third party authority, whether it's FDA, for example, um, all these are milestones or goals that you need to put in place. But then you kind of reverse engineer work backwards. What are the mini steps I need to do every week? And you define a metric for that in terms of progression. So sometimes it's not about the number of units and the number of dollar sales. It could be a percentage of progress uh, from step one to step 10. All right. And you want to measure that against a certain time frame. The other aspect of uh, hardware is even though you don't have a customer, you should be talking to customers from day one. You should be talking to them in terms of, you know, um, hey, I've got this idea, I'm working on this uh, prototype. Can I have this conversation with you? So a, a unit of measurement on that is how many customer engagements do you have in a week? Even if you're not going to launch the product in six months, you should be talking to them today. Because the validation that you get, which is badly needed, to see whether your product is got a future, should begin at the very beginning, not when you finish making the product. Mm -hmm. So I would really encourage that as well, to kind of customer engagements, pre-order. Um, you can always sign contracts, conditions to quality, delivery, and what have you. Mm -hmm. And having those pre-contracts in hand is a very powerful weapon for you to go raise funding. Okay, you suggest to investors that there's a good, there's a, there's a product market fit even before you have launched your product. You have already mentioned the vanity uh, metrics uh, in your presentation, but in the broad sense, when you um, have a, a meeting with the uh, startups and they also present you on the meeting, um, which, uh, uh, um, which metrics or KPIs do you see that startups are usually use and investors are not interested in? So I have a very interesting case. I can't reveal names because they, they all the companies that I invested in. But we, we've seen a company that um, was a beneficiary of um, COVID-19 because they're in the healthcare supply business. And mind you, the, their sales has just gone off the charts, literally off the charts, you know, like 100x from what they actually expected. And, and it so happens it was also a period of fundraising for them. And there was a lot of interest. But sadly, after two months of fundraising, uh, the vast majority, at least a really top-notch uh, VCs, said, we, we will give this a pass. Come back to us in six months. And the prognosis on that, when I spoke with the founder and I spoke to the investors, is that they think that the sales revenue was a vanity metrics in their eyes, in their mind. And they think it's just a flash in the pan, uh, a, flash in, uh, a flash in the pan, so to speak, experience. Because of COVID-19, this two, three months, everyone's buying PPP, uh, PPE uh, supplies. But what happens when you get back to business as usual? Now, I'm convinced the business has stronger fundamentals than just incredible sales they've been getting. But the founder was not able to articulate the uniqueness about the e-commerce platform, the AI uh, that drives the algorithms to match supplier and distributors, all that was lost in the conversation because of the overwhelming uh, vanity metric, in this case being the revenue and sales. So it's really important that when you, when you present yourself to investors, they have a very sharp eye. They've seen hundreds of proposals. They know what they're asking. They know what they're looking for that you really pay attention to the fundamentals of the business, which are the leading indicators, that they know that if they invest today a million dollars, that this company is going to sustain and scale 
beyond any external event that's unfolding. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, several questions, so I will sum up uh, uh, this session uh, with the last questions. Um, what are the important growth metrics in your point of view? I, I mean, uh, there's a question from uh, Nagyash. Uh, what is the most important as a growth metric? Increased pricing, profits over time due to market, marking a brand name or number of uh, more number of sales? Yeah, so I think there's 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 a we need to decouple that question slightly, <laughs> and what is value, right? So I think in terms of growth, uh, you think about the uh, man on mind growth of customer acquisitions, so new new customers coming to say a platform or if it's SaaS um, acquisition, you know, it's enterprise SaaS for example. Uh, the, the, the degree of growth, the degree, the delta of change, whether it's week to week or month to month or quarter to quarter, has to be exponentially growing. The delta has to be great, not just the numbers. And that is telling about how fast this company can grow. On the flip side of it, it's a value KPI, which means to say the inherent value of the company being uh, the number of customers it has, the stickiness, uh, the behavioral uh, metrics, which could be, you know, I'm a huge fan of this company because the experience has been phenomenal. And that could be captured through NPS scores, could be retention rates, uh, could be, you know, uh, the referral program you might have referring to other customers. This is telling about the value of the company because it's, it suggests that the company has uh, able to retain customers. And when you dissect the both, the, the growth metric and the value metric, one thing that links, uh, uh, leads them to, together is this, that when you have your strategy right, uh, it equals cash. So, so whenever you're running out of cash, there's one lesson that you should learn or one takeaway today, if you're running out of cash or you're burning too much cash, go and look at the other side of the equation, which is strategy. Something is wrong with the strategy. If you're generating cash, something is absolutely right about the strategy. So if you think that your cash is depleting, it's not because you're bad customers out there, your pricing is low or your pricing is high, it's the strategy. Your business model. So think about that. That's a very important lesson to think away. And um, I mean, a very uh, follow-up question. The outbreak, uh, just right, uh, three months um, uh, time span has shifted most of the startups' um, key metrics. Uh, so how uh, should they um, uh, tell the difference and all the modifications while they are doing? and investor pitch about this uh, situation, current situation? Yes, that, that is tough. Firstly, I, I just want to express a personal point. I think I, I feel your pain because I've been dealing with a number of companies that has been just uh, hit uh, by the devastation in the industry, for example, like aviation and hospitality. So I'll use one example of a hospitality business. We have got a company that is um, uh, matching talent for the hospitality industry in Europe. And as a result, with COVID-19, the lockdown, uh, the business came to a standstill. They already had, you know, ARRs of uh, two million before this, really doing well, great fan base. So they have to pivot in the interim, with the hope that um, uh, this was going to turn around. So the two metrics they're paying attention to is uh, their burn rate. How do you reduce the burn rate? So you cut costs, and how do you uh, because no investor is going to be enthusiastic at the moment to be willing to invest in a seemingly uh, pretty bad chip industry, being the hospitality tourism industry. And then the second metric is really looking at uh, engagement. So while they don't actually have customers who wish to engage uh, new talent or new hires, what they're doing, in fact, is they're providing webinars, they're providing content, and they're allowing 
uh, a diversion of traffic from the talent pool to new industries that corporates are hiring and reskilling them in the process. But what that translates to is while that's a move to survive, it also is doing something incredible, which is energizing the talent pool base, which is their customer base, to a level that this company really cares for them. So there's a silver lining in this whole experience, right? That you actually are uh, reinforcing uh, your brand by helping others in need at the time when it's difficult for everyone to survive. So th that, that, that's an example I like to put forward. Last question. Um, uh, you have mentioned while uh, starting the presentation about uh, uh, selecting the startups from Startup Istanbul. Uh, how can uh, um, also uh, startups can apply you, to you? And how did you select the startups uh, while you were in Istanbul? Uh, what are the criteria that you look for? Yes, uh, that's a good one. So, uh, firstly, you can apply to Texas anytime. If you go onto the website, we've got a number of good programs running around the world. Uh, where I'm based in Abu Dhabi, applications will open in July. But in the meantime, you can reach out to me on my email, vijay.tirithra uh, at texas.com. And uh, I'll be happy to entertain you, whichever it is. Uh, how do we look for companies? Well, at the very high level, this may not be any new thing, is we look at the team at this very early stage. Uh, what can you bring to the table, your experience, your credentials, your vision, your strategy? Of course, then we'll look at your technology and your go-to-market strategy. So when you talk about Istanbul and experience, I think you, um, Mr. Burak has organized over 100 pitches. And, um, you know, I guess partly it's through experience, you know who you're looking for and what you're looking for. And you're looking for that very unique uh, industry niche which you think that could be a $100 million company one day. Now, that's a big expectation on anyone, but back of my mind, I ask myself, can this be a $100 million company? And, and often they may not be the top rank uh, candidate on stage by the judges. So, so that's interesting. Uh, so, so I tend to look at it from a point of view that uh, can they have the propensity to grow, but also how I can add value based on my entrepreneurial experience, my business experience, my network, and leveraging on Techstars and Hub 71, how can we help this company grow? And we think we can add value, then that's a good partnership uh, to invest in these companies. Because for us, it's not about the investment dollars, it's more about helping companies grow. And if we think we can really make a huge difference, then we really want to work with those founders and we will definitely take the risk to invest. I'll tell you one uh, anecdote, which I think is, is a good closing one. About two years ago, uh, four guys came to me. They're working at McKinsey here in Dubai. And they said, um, look, we don't have a business plan. So we, we don't have anything in writing, but uh, we have a kind of a businessman in mind. I said, what is it? He says, we would like to build a flying car. So I looked at them and I go, are these guys for real? So I joke, I said, you know, growing up, I used to watch the Jetsons. I also wanted to build a flying car. Let's do this together. <laughs> but then when they, when they came back at, in, a, in a meeting in Costa, they go, this is our vision and all this. Now, of course, when you evaluate the team, three of them have PhDs in, uh, in aviation, rocket science, uh, engineering. Uh, one had a, a, you know, an airline experience business. And I said, fine, you got a deal. So without an application, without a, uh, a business plan, I said, go ahead and submit the application. I, I think we'd like to give you a shot. And they went through the rigorous process we put before them, and they got invited and they got uh, admitted into our program, and we didn't invest with them. So uh, that goes to show you sometimes it's not just having an MVP ready, you just got to have the right ingredients as a team, and we'll be willing to take the risk. Vijay, thank you very much for your valuable time and this uh, great uh, presentation about uh, metrics. I think it was very valuable for all of the startups attending today and will be watching afterwards. And hope to 
meet you again in Istanbul after uh, this coronavirus has been completed. Thank you very much, Virat. It's been a, a true pleasure. And to everyone else, uh, be well and be safe. And we should look forward to seeing you one day in Istanbul. Hopefully. Have a great day. Stay Thank safe you. and healthy. Thank you.